The scientists who came to Los Alamos to build the first atomic bomb in World War II did not come alone. Many brought their wives and families along to the secret city nicknamed The Hill. Author Tara Shea Nesbitt explores the lives of these women in her new novel, The Wives of Los Alamos. Hampered by a lack of infrastructure and housing and left in the dark about what their husbands were actually doing, these women bring a unique perspective to a crucial period of our history, as well as voices that have been largely absent in previous narratives. NOIF producer Megan Kamrick sat down with Nesbitt for our one-on-one -on -one segment. Tara Shea Nesbitt, thank you for coming on New Mexico in Focus to talk about your new book. The Wives of Los Alamos. Thank you. It's great to be here. This is a, a really fascinating novel, and I just want to uh, set this up for a little bit. Who are these wives that you chronicle in the book? Give us a sense of their range of their backgrounds and their experiences. Sure, right? So um, these are the wives of Los Alamos are the women whose husbands were building the atomic bomb, but they didn't know what their husbands were building. And the story takes place, it starts in 1943 when their husbands come home and say, how would you like to move to the Southwest? And they have no idea where they're going to be moving to. And oftentimes their husbands know, but are not able to tell their wives that information. Their average age was 25. Um, they were coming from all over the world. They had doctorates, um, doctoral degrees in chemistry. They, they were stay-at-home moms. They were dancers in the, ba the Chicago Ballet. So there was a range of social workers, a range of professions that they were. Um, yeah, so that's who they were. This is, I mean, that's what's so interesting is, you know, you have a great story about <laughs> Robert Oppenheimer showing up on someone's doorstep to invite their husband to come do this project. And then he comes out and said, we're, we're going on an adventure, we're moving to the southwest. <laughs> they had to move their households, their children, or some of them were pregnant, um, if they didn't have children yet, to a place with almost no infrastructure. So what was that like? Yeah, they had, um, there was, the town itself, as we know it, of course, wasn't there. There was the um, Los Alamos Boys School, the ranch school, so there were a couple of stone homes and Fuller Lodge. But other than that, the military was coming in and building um, tons and tons of prefabricated places. Secretly. Secretly. So they would arrive and they would get off of a train, they would go to um, a location in Santa Fe. 109 Palisades. <laughs> That's right. They would meet by um, a woman who would say, welcome, and here is the map to get you up to Los Alamos. They would follow that. Um, the roads were dusty or muddy, depending on the weather, the time of year that they were arriving, and they would just see all this wild construction and homes that all looked completely identical. Um, and there would be, it seems like, a lot of chaos. The hospital wasn't, wasn't built, the schools weren't built. Even getting water was sketchy. Yeah, the water, the water was yeah. sketchy. Um, and of course, immediately they go to the housing office and they ask, um, where am I going to be staying? And that was a real point of um, interest because if you were in one of the original stone homes, you had a bathtub and that meant you had this, that was your social, your social privilege in a way, even though there wasn't really enough water ever <laughs> to fill the bathtub. That's why they call it bathtub row. That's right, that's right. Those and houses. one of the, one of the women named it that, dub, dubbed it bathtub. Because the other, otherwise you just took a shower, which <clears throat> wasn't really what women were used to doing, right, in the 40s. They were. You standing in a bathtub. <laughs> yeah, and you were, you were to take, you were, um, there were a lot of notices about water. So when I was doing research, I would look at the Historical Society and through the archives, and I found these daily calendars of the things that they would do every single day. The movies they would watch, the knitting circles, all these things That's that were being announced. Um, and there were just always announcements about water sort shortages. And they were instructed to take good citizen showers where they would scrub up. <laughs> you know, everything had sort of a military name to it um, and a, a sense of, um, for the war effort. So they would scrub up, they would start to turn on the water, nothing would come out, and some of the women were like, I was, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> you take a unique approach to the narrative. It's told through a collective voice rather than through individual characters. Why did you want to do it that way? Yeah, um, I'm so glad you asked that. It's a first person plural point of view, so there's the sense of a we, it was like this for us. And I chose that point of view because when I was doing the research, I found that the women in interviews would be asked, 
what was it like living in Los Alamos? And they would quickly answer with a collective response. Um, we all had these stoves named Black Beauty that were really temperamental. At, where the we was definitely the wives, the other women that they were bonding with during that time. So I chose the point of view primarily to show that sense of collective identity, which seemed natural to the way that they were telling mm. their own stories. And then also to show the differentiation that happens, particularly when the bombs are used. You can start to see the, the factions that come out within the group. And so I'm hoping that that shows a tension that always exists for us between our individual selves and our group selves. You know, uh, the community is secret, it's behind a gate, and it doesn't exist as far as the rest of the world knows. Almost no contact with the outside world. They couldn't even tell their families where they were going. How did that impact the day-to-day -day lives on top of all these other, you know, daily struggles just to, to maintain a household? Yeah, I mean, I imagine, you know, you can't, you write letters home to your parents, but you can't tell them where you are. You don't have your, your social networks, your friends that you had back in San Francisco or back in Omaha. And so there was a lot of reliance that then turns to the friendships that you are making in this new place. Um, also a lot of stress. And the husbands couldn't tell their wives what they were building. So I do wonder about the way that, um, the, the way your emotional life changes with your partner when you don't have, when you can't share this major secret. I get a sense of that, um, that they just can't talk about these things and you, you give glimmers of like, that alter, permanently alters some marriages because just for a couple of years you just can't talk yeah, and about how that certain things. How that changes your relationship if you have three years of not, not really being able to talk about anything. You know, there's the, one of the greatest gatherings of intellectual minds of that generation in this place, but a lot of these wives couldn't really participate in that necessarily, that's even though they were also accomplished. Yeah, that's true. You know, um, some wives, so they, when they arrived, a lot of them were asked to work in the lab, but not in um, large science capacities, but as secretaries. For instance, there's a woman who has a degree from, from a, de a doctoral degree in chemistry and is asked to take a typing test. Oh. So you have, the, <laughs> you have this, like, you cannot participate. And I think that that also created um, a little bit of tension between the, the women scientists, because there were women scientists there, a few of them, and they were able to be working in the lab with their husbands. They were taking walks with their husbands. They had this bonding time mm -hmm. that, the, that the wives didn't, didn't have because they weren't in on that. There have been many books on Los Alamos and a number of memoirs, including some by wives who went with their husbands to the secret city. Why did you want to do a novel like this? Why bring out these voices? Why are they important to hear? Yeah, these women helped make the bomb. These women were very much a part of our American story, our world story of, of the creation of the atomic bomb. But their voices aren't heard, and the way that they contributed isn't often thought about. But they were making this community. They were supporting their husbands. They were working in the lab. And I, I wanted to give voice to what has previously been voiceless, but I don't think should be. And do you have a sense of the long-term impact that this experience had on their lives? Yeah, it, um, it's been described, some of the women described it like a summer camp for adults. And so it was this wild time. They're in their late 20s and they're on this adventure, but that adventure is kind of halted by the, the use of the atomic bombs. And the way that the women reacted to that are very much varied. Some women stayed with their husbands and lived their lives out in Los Alamos. Some women went back to San Francisco and felt a lot of remorse and grief related to what they were um, accomplices in. So it's, it, it was definitely a range, but it seems like it was just such an important story in all of these women's lives. Well, Tara Shea, thank you so much for coming to talk with us about this. And if we we'll stick around a little bit, we'll do some more on the web. Great, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.